Good morning, church family. Isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord this morning? I'm excited to be here, as I hope you are, as we get ready to worship the one true living God, our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Just a few announcements, and I'm excited about these announcements as well. So the first thing I want to share with you is the result of our mission offering, our emphasis last Sunday. And this gets me pumped, just to see the giving and how cheerfully, and I hope you all get excited and behind this as well, but last Sunday, the total amount that was given was $52,832. Praise God. Praise God for that. And if you weren't here last Sunday, or maybe you forgot, we still have these little red envelopes in the chair backs in front of you. You can still give towards that. And so this number, again, remember what it's going towards uh, as, as we send out and we give to um, those that are on mission, local ministries, those across the state, and even to the ends of the earth. And so please continue to give in that way as the Lord leads you. Also, there will be an interest meeting for the Guatemala mission trip following service this morning in the gym right through the fellowship hall. And again, this is an interest meeting, so please, if it's not like you're, you're committing today, this is where you're just going to hear information about the trip, what to expect, and, and how the Lord is working in that community where we would be going to serve. And so I would encourage you, even, even if this is something that would be brand new to you, go and, and at least hear about what God is doing in Guatemala. And then also tonight, or not tonight, this, this afternoon from 4 to 5.30, we have The Nest. And so if you're not familiar with The Nest, it is a gathering of moms of, of all ages for the purpose of prayer, community, and encouragement for Christ-centered motherhood. And so what a great opportunity to, to gather together, to pray for one another, uh, to grow closer in your walk with the Lord, and, and build even in Christian and fellowship and community uh, with, with moms. And so that is from 4 to 5.30 in the fellowship hall this afternoon. And then we also have a golf scramble coming up on April 2nd. If you love Jesus, if you love people, you may not even love golf, but this is a, a great way where you can connect with neighbors, coworkers, invite them. If they love the game of golf, you can be the, the caddy, the cart, cart driver, uh, anything, to, but to invite them to come and be a part, that way you can build gospel-centered relationships with them. And again, that's April 2nd. You can sign up at the Connect desk. You can sign up online um, as well. And then also next Sunday, Put this in your calendar if it's not there already. Daylight savings, all right? I know some of us are going to be disappointed. We're, we're springing forward, all right? So make sure if you have a smartphone, hopefully it stays smart and adjusts for you. But if not, set those alarms uh, so that you can be here on time for life group and for worship. And then if you're here today with us, maybe it's your first time, your fifth, your tenth, but we want to get to know you. And you see this green card in the seat back in front of you. It's what we call our Connect card. You can fill this out and take it to our Connect desk, and we've got a gift there for you. Uh, but we want to get to know you, how we can serve you, minister to you. And if uh, filling out a card is not your thing or you're watching with us at home, you can text the word STEPS to 484848. Just another way for us to get to know you more and to minister and love on you. And so we're grateful to be here in the house of the Lord. Let me pray for us as we continue in worship. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for putting breath in our lungs. Lord, bringing us here. God, giving us the opportunity to, to worship you. Lord, may we make this time all about you, God, because you are worthy of all of our praise. And so, Lord, as we lift you up in song, as we receive your word, Lord, may we be challenged and encouraged, and as we leave this place, Lord, may we live differently this week because of you and for you. I pray all of this in Christ's name, amen. sought the Lord, and He answered me, and delivered me from every fear. Those who look on Him are radiant, but never be the same, but never be the same.
That's our prayer this morning, that we would come together and magnify the name of the Lord. We would glorify the name of the Lord. I also want to say it is a great pleasure to sing with my father-in-law this morning. That's Olivia's dad, Mike Morton. But church, let's stand to our feet and let's lift high the name of Jesus. That's what Psalm 34 says. Come and exalt his name together. Glorify and magnify his name. Lift your voices, church.
church, everything we do this morning is for the praise of the Lord, whether it's in song, whether it's the preaching of the word, or celebration through baptism. Praise God. We see this almost every week. Let's remain standing and continue our worship through baptism this morning. Well, good morning, church. Hope you're doing well this morning. I come bringing something that uh, is another praise to our God. So salvation is definitely worthy of that. And this morning, Mr. Michael Matthias comes literally just a week and a half ago, a church member visited his house, presented the gospel, and God used his spirit and used his word to make a new heart, Mr. Michael here. And now you get to see him fall in obedience and baptism. So definitely praiseworthy today. So guys, we thank you for being here, standing in celebration as a church family and supporting him. Guys, Mr. Michael Matthias, is it your public profession that Jesus Christ is Lord? Awesome. Well, based off your profession, buddy, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us never take for granted what God's doing here at First Baptist Church Millington and our youth. This is my beloved grandson. This is Joshua Sherman, who was saved last Saturday in D now. Joshua, who is it that you profess to be your Lord and Savior? Jesus. Amen. Well, based upon that profession of faith, I baptize you. My dear brother and grandson, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I love you.
you go before us nothing can stand against the power of our god you shine in the shadows you win everybody Amen. nothing can stand against the power of our come on church on my has made a way to the foot of the throne. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong
we come before you today and we thank you that you have made a way for us. My sinful soul is counted free because you look on Jesus and pardon me. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for what he did for us. Lord, and I'm always amazed that, that he knew what he had to do long before he did it, and he did it anyways. Lord, you've already done all the work. We just have to give it to you. So Lord, thank you that my battle belongs to you. Thank you that my soul belongs to you, and that I am counted righteous and justified in your eyes because of Jesus. Please be with us now as we continue to worship, empower and protect our pastor as he rightly divides the word of truth and preaches your word. Lord, we love you. We praise you. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you, church. All right, if you'll take your Bible and turn with me to Luke chapter 22. Today we begin our journey from the garden to Golgotha. We'll be looking at the text in the Garden of Gethsemane today and over the upcoming weeks we're going to make the process from the night where Jesus was arrested all the way through his death upon the cross ending on Sunday night, April 10th, when we partake of the Lord's Supper in remembrance of his death on our behalf. Then the following Sunday on April 17th is Easter Sunday as we gather to celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I do want to point out that we celebrate his resurrection every Sunday, uh, but uh, April 17th is Easter Sunday. Luke chapter 22, we're going to be looking at verses 39 through 46 as we take this journey uh, together. The title of the series is From the Garden to Golgotha, and the title of this message is Jesus in the Garden. Jesus in the Garden. If you join, if you found the text in Luke 22, please join me in standing for the reading of God's Word. Again, I'll be reading verses 39 through 46. And he, Jesus, came out and proceeded as was his custom to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples also followed him. When he arrived at the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done." Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. And being in agony, he was praying very fervently. And his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. When he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping from sorrow. And said to them, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not enter into temptation. This is the word of of the living God. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that your word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. We thank you, Lord God, that your word penetrates the depths of our soul and spirit. And I pray, Lord God, that you would penetrate each of our hearts today with your truth and lead us to learn from Jesus. Lead us, Lord God, to practice what we sang a moment ago, to bow before you with arms lifted high in adoration of you, yielded and submitted to you and your will. This is our prayer. We pray it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. A minister was out making a visit to one of the ladies of the church, and when he knocked on the door, one of her children answered, and he said, may I see your mother for just a moment? And the child, about nine years old, said, I'm sorry, but she is unavailable till 10 o'clock. Every morning from 9 to 10, she knows that I am not allowed to disturb her, for she is in prayer. 
The pastor waited 40 minutes for that lady to come out of her prayer closet with the glory of the Lord upon her face, and he knew why God's hand of blessing and favor was upon that family. Today, we're going to talk about prayer and the necessity of it, not the option of it, but the necessity of it. See, it was that mother's custom to pray. It was that mother's custom to have a certain specific time that she got alone, was not bothered by a phone, was not bothered by anything, and she met with the Father. She had a certain location in which she met with the Father. Jesus, likewise, traveled from place to place, and so he didn't just have one place, but as he went from place to place, he had his place for that place, if you know what I mean. And when he was in Jerusalem, it was common for him to go to the Mount of Olives. And the Mount of Olives is also where he ended up ascending to the right hand of the Father after his resurrection. But the Mount of Olives at the base of it, at the bottom of the Mount of Olives, you find the Garden of Gethsemane. And so when you see that it says he went out to the Mount of Olives, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, which was on the lower portion of that mountain. He had a specific place that he went to. Judas knew where to bring the Jewish soldiers to arrest Jesus because Judas knew that was the custom of Jesus for him to be there praying. He could count on it. Do you have a place that is your custom to pray? And do you have a time that is your custom to pray? Leads us to number one, the behavior of Jesus. The behavior of Jesus. In verses 39 through 44, we find seven descriptions, seven behavioral aspects of Jesus that we see here. All of these occurred here in this text. All of these took place on the night he was arrested. The Passover meal, they've completed that. He's introduced the Lord's Supper to his disciples. Judas has gone away to betray him. And now they've, they've sung a song after the Lord's Supper and they've made their way outside the wall of Jerusalem to the bottom of the Mount of Olives, to the Garden of Gethsemane for a season of prayer. All seven of these descriptions, I've come up with the letter R, all right? So if you want to write seven notes, write seven R's, I mentioned that because I'm not good at alliteration. I happen to do it this time, all right? It's very rare. So here we go. Number one, the retreat of Jesus. Verse 39 says, and he came out and proceeded, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples also followed him. As I shared a moment ago, the mother had a custom to pray. She had a custom to pray from nine to 10. She had a custom to pray in her prayer closet inside the house. Jesus likewise had a custom to pray, and he was at the Mount of Olives. He was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and that's again why Judas knew, how Judas knew where to go. It was his custom. It was a common pattern of his to go to this place to pray. Let me ask you, Is there a chair wore out in your house because that's your place to pray? Are there imprints in the floor where two knees have been because that's your customary place to pray? Is there a rocker on your back porch because that's your customary place to pray? Is there a trail in the woods that is worn down because that's your customary place to walk and pray? It was Jesus' custom to pray. And I'm not talking about a quick five-second prayer here. There's prayers where we pray together. There's prayers that are short and quick. But there are prayers where you have no hurry and your phone will not interrupt it. Where you are alone, not just talking, but listening. You know, a lot of your prayer life needs to be listening. More needs to be listening than telling or even requesting. Jesus himself, as God the Son, saw the necessity to pray to the Father. How much more do we need to pray? To know the will of God in our lives. He retreated to be alone 
with the Father. Now, let me ask you something. Do you think you are busier than Jesus was? Isn't that a common thing today? Isn't that our common excuse? I'm just so busy. I think Jesus had a lot of things to be doing. I don't think he had lazy days. There were always people wanting him to heal them, wanting him to go to this house and heal a relative, to raise the dead, to feed the hungry, to give sight to the blind. And here he is in Jerusalem, and he knows his time has come. Tomorrow morning, he's going to be on the cross. It is the night before he is crucified. And what does he make time to do? Pray. It wasn't optional. It was a necessity to him. Second, the recommendation of Jesus Verse 40, when he arrived at the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Now, some other gospels let us know that he told the nine to stay here, and actually Judas is gone, so he told eight of them to stay here and pray. He took James, Peter, and John a little further, and he told them to pray. And then he went, as the text will tell us, a stone's throw further, and he prayed alone. So here he takes them in to the Mount of Olives, and when they arrived at the Garden of Gethsemane there at the Mount of Olives, he said to them, pray. Here's why. You need to pray that you don't enter into temptation because you're about to enter into temptation if you don't. So you need to pray. Now, what did Jesus know that the disciples didn't know? What did Jesus know that Peter didn't know? Peter, just a little earlier, that same day, said, I will go to prison and even to death with you, Jesus. And Jesus says, by this time tomorrow, a rooster's going to crow. You're going to deny me three times, and then a rooster's going to crow. And Peter's like, no, not me. Jesus knew the time was coming when that that temptation would come, that testing would come, and Peter's going to fail it if he doesn't pray. And we know that he doesn't pray, and he goes on to fail. Now, what did the other disciples do when Judas brings the soldiers? What do they do? We don't hear anything more about them. Peter follows Jesus at a distance, and it doesn't mention the others. Now, since the Scripture doesn't say much, I can only speculate. So this isn't law, okay? I could be wrong, but I think they left in fear. I think they ran because they were not prepared to see Jesus actually arrested and beaten in front of them. And so they scattered They weren't ready for the temptation that was coming. They weren't ready to stand true to the Lord Jesus when it was coming because they didn't pray. Jesus recommended to them that they pray. You know, I can't stand before you and say, you know what, I missed out on this blessing. I missed out on knowing God's will here because I didn't pray. I can't tell you the examples typically of that because I didn't pray to know what I missed out on. If I failed to pray, I can't just sit here and tell you what I missed out on, but God knows good and well what I missed out on. And when you fail to set aside time to pray, you're missing out on the answers God has for you. You could be here today saying, I have, I have asked everyone to pray for me. I'm going through this situation. I pray you know, for 30 seconds here, 30 seconds there, all throughout the day. I've been waiting for God to answer He's just not giving me any direction. You know what? He's waiting for you to get alone with him for 30 minutes and be still and know that he's God and he might tell you. But you've been too busy for that. You'll fit the 30-second prayer in there, but you don't have time to meet with him. You don't have time to listen. And therefore, you don't know the answer. And therefore, you go to others. Let me tell you, the greatest counselor in all the world is the Lord. Anyone that wants me to help them, I'll I'll, I'll help you. I'll pray for you, and I'll give you the best counsel I know how. But my counsel is not impeccable. His is. Don't go to others looking for answers when God's willing to give the answer. You just won't give the time in order to learn the answer. Prayer is not a last resort. It is your number one weapon. I don't promote many movies, but the movie War Room preaches this all throughout it. Enter into battle through prayer. That is your weapon. 
Jesus is recommending that they pray, that they not enter into temptation. Number three, the retirement of Jesus, verse 41, and he withdrew from them about a stone's throw. So now the disciples and James, Peter, and John are there, and Jesus walks over to the other side of our platform here, and and, and there's trees around. It's the Garden of Gethsemane, and he kneels down to pray alone. They're not far off, but he's alone. So he can spend time in prayer and not be interrupted. Now, verse 41 And he knelt down and began to pray. The next to last song we just sang talked about going on my knees and lifting my hands. We belted that out in worship to our Lord. You might say, I can't get on my knees. If you physically can't, then do so spiritually. But if you physically can, do so. There is something accomplished when we humble ourselves. Now, you can still be prideful in this position, but you're less likely to be. You can still be prideful in this position, but you're less likely to be. Are y'all with me? Your posture helps the environment and helps you to focus and helps you realize that when you're praying, you're not just having a conversation. Yes, Jesus is our friend that walks with us along life's narrow way. But when we're in prayer, we need to realize we're talking to one that's not equal. He is superior. He is the one that knows everything. He is the one that has a will for our lives. And we are to submit to his will. Not your, not my will, but yours be done on earth as it is in heaven So here Jesus retires, and when he retires, what does he do? He falls down on his knees before the Father to say the following words, which are basically, he's all going to offer his request, but then he's going to say, but your will be done. He's in a posture of submission and humility, and he's then going to speak words of humility and submission. Leonard Ravenhill, the famous English evangelist that lived from 1907 to 1994, said this, the church is dying on its feet because it's not living on its knees. Profound statement. And if you pay attention to what's happened in Britain, that has certainly happened there. The church has died on its feet because the church has not been living on its knees. Jesus spent time in solitary prayer on his knees before the Father. When our bodies descend, our hearts and our minds ascend. Jesus went to his customary place to get in his customary posture before the Father. Do you have a customary place, a customary time, a customary posture? Number four, the request of Jesus. The request of Jesus, verse 42, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Here is Jesus offering a petition, offering a request of the Lord. Now, the word cup there is a common metaphor for the suffering of Jesus. Will you remove this cup from me? Will you remove this weight, this burden, this tremendous, overwhelming responsibility of paying the price for all the sin of all the world of all time? Will you please? Is there any other way, in other words? Now, I want to read to you Mark's account of this same story. Mark chapter 14, beginning in verse 33. It states that Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and began to be very distressed and troubled. So there you get his state. He's troubled and distressed. And he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. He went a little beyond them. That's where he went a stone's throw. Verse 35, and he went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass by, pass him by. And he was saying, Abba, Father. Daddy, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Now, this text seems to trouble some people. 
What are we to make of this? We need to realize Jesus is speaking in his humanity. Jesus was, yes, 100% God. He's 100% man. And when you look at him as 100% man, it is not hard to fathom and comprehend and understand why he's saying what he's saying here. Yes, he wanted sinners to be redeemed and, and saved, but he also wanted not to endure stakes going through his hands and feet. He didn't want to endure getting hit with a cat of nine tails 39 times, ripping his flesh from his body. Like that vocabulary, ripping flesh from body. Okay. But being torn up from the flogging, from the scourging. He did not want to get, have a crown of thorns beaten into his head. He didn't want to go through the mockery. If I offered that to you, would you volunteer happily? Of course not, because in your humanity, no one wants to go through that physical suffering. And he knew that's what was about to happen. And so he's saying simply, Father, all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. If there's another way to save humanity, oh God, do that. Remove this burden and this responsibility from me. At 33 years old, who would not want to avoid dying? So we ask, is there another way? Now, please understand there's a difference here between being willing to die and seeking to die. Jesus is not saying he's not willing to die. He's just simply saying, if there's another way, I'd like to not have to go through this. But notice what he ends with, not my will but yours. So he's submitting even as, as he's asking. But he tells us to ask, right, in Scripture, so he's asking. He was willing to die, not seeking to die. David, King David, before he was king, when Saul was king, David would go out and fight battle after battle after battle. Why? Not because he was seeking to be in arm's way, but he was seeking to please the king that gave him the orders to go. Daniel, when he prayed, he, did, he wasn't seeking to go in the lion's den, but if it meant that he had to go by praying, he was willing to go to the lion's den. The three Hebrew boys, when Nebuchadnezzar makes the big statue in the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 3, and he commands all people to bow and worship the statue, but they will not do it. They were not seeking to be put in the fiery furnace. They were seeking to please the Lord and willing to be put in the fiery furnace. There's a difference in seeking and willing to die. Jesus is willing to. He's just not seeking to go through the suffering. Jesus didn't want to suffer and die, but Jesus did want to save sinners. Therefore, he was willing to die. Now, the text doesn't stop there. Notice what Jesus says next. To prove that he's willing, verse number five, the resignation of Jesus. Or you could say the submission of Jesus. Verse 42 saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Yes, Jesus had his desire, but ultimately, whatever you say, Father, I will do. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I want you to stop and meditate upon that for a moment. Jesus had his desire, but Jesus was more concerned with the will of the Father than satisfying his own desire. What in your life are you more concerned with satisfying your desire than the will of the Father? There was nothing in Jesus' life. Serious moment. We need to, we need to live this, we need to practice this right here. If God's will for you is to take a job that makes less money, will you do it? If God's will for you is to represent Christ to someone risking that friendship and that they might not be in your life anymore, will you do it? Ultimately, Jesus, yes, had his desire, but ultimately, Father, whatever your will is, I will do it. And he's setting the example for you and for me. He models what it means to follow the Father. 
Please don't use prayer to manipulate God, to try to manipulate God to do what you want. Have prayer equip you to do what he wants. Let me say that again. I thought it was pretty good. Don't use and don't try to use prayer to get God to agree with what you want. But use prayer for God to equip you for what he wants. Let him change you to his will. Jesus went to his secluded place, his customary place. He had a humble posture in his customary place. He had a submissive approach to the will of the Father in his customary place. He was fully submitted to the will of God, and you and I are to do the same. He didn't seek in his humanity to have to endure the suffering, but he was willing to endure the suffering. Six, the revival of Jesus. Verse, six, uh, verse 46 says, not 46, 43, excuse me. Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. Now this revival of Jesus is not a spiritual revival. He wasn't a sinner that needed to repent and get right with the Father. This revival is a, spirit, is a, is a physical and emotional revival. It's a revival where, okay, I, I now know your will, I'm all in. All right, I'm, 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 I'm on board. I've asked if there's any other way. There's no other way. You've sent an angel to encourage me. I'm now ready to follow in your ways. As, and he was before, but now he has a different perspective on it due to the encouraging angel. The angel that the Father sent from heaven to Jesus is not one that could die for our sins, for there was only one that could die for our sins, and that's who the angel went to encourage, that he would go through with the mission of going to the cross for you and me to bear our sins in his body upon the cross. Even the Lord Jesus had an angel encourage him. Let that encourage you. When you receive news of great hardship, suffering, persecution, a drastic change in your life, I want you to know that heaven has angels that come to you, whether it's one or many, you have at least an angel that comes to you to minister to you, to encourage you, to strengthen you, just as Jesus did in his time of crisis. Number seven, the reaction of Jesus, verse 44. In being in agony, he was praying very fervently. The angel encouraged Jesus, and he continued to pray, and he was praying passionately. He was praying fervently. Why? For the same reason I've already emphasized, the weight upon him. Stay with me here now. Don't think about the weight on you. Think about the weight on Jesus for a moment. The weight you put on him, and all others have put on him. the weight of atoning for sin, the weight of the torture to come, the weight of being on the cross and knowing that God the Father would have to let him go through the complete suffering unto death without intervening to pay the price for your sin. Imagine that burden, carrying the guilt and iniquity of us all upon himself. So now Jesus takes that burden and he prays fervently to the Father. Not flippantly, fervently. Are you known for fervent prayer? Verse 44 says, And being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. The reference to sweat like drops of blood used to be taken as an exaggeration just to show the stress of Jesus But now we know, medically speaking, there is a word for this. It's hematidrosis. I hope I said it right. It's where tiny blood vessels rupture in the sweat glands, thus producing a mixture of blood and sweat. Hematidrosis occurs under severe emotional distress. Jesus was 100% human, and that's what's being emphasized here. Not as deity, he is God, but he's struggling in the humanity aspect of who he is. He's a man. He's a human being just like you and I. And yet he knew what was coming in the next 24 hours. And he was under great emotional distress. 
We've addressed the behavior of Jesus in the garden. Now, number two, and by the way, if you're wondering, there's only two. Which there were seven subpoints to one, right? There's not seven to number two. But number two, the teaching of Jesus. We've talked about the behavior of Jesus, now the teaching of Jesus, verse 45. When he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping from sorrow and said to them, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Why were they sleeping due to sorrow? Jesus had numerous times told them that I'm going to be handed over. I'm going to be persecuted. I'm going to be crucified but on the third day, raised from the dead. He had told them that numerous times. Then at the Last Supper, earlier that night before they went out to the garden, he told them in Luke twenty-two eighteen 18, that he would no longer drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And so they knew that time was close for a major change to happen. He was going to go away. He was not going to be among them. He was not going to be with them. And so they were sorrowful. But friend, please, please get this. Feeling sorrow and being sorrowful is not the equivalent of praying. You can feel very bad for someone. You can be brokenhearted about someone's situation, but that doesn't mean you're taking the time to take their situation and, and what they're going through to the Lord in fervent prayer. The disciples were sorrowful, but they weren't praying. They were sleeping. And notice in verse 46, he says exactly the same thing he said back in verse 40. Get up, pray that you may not enter into temptation. He said that at the beginning. They didn't listen to him. They fell asleep. He's saying it to him again. Why? Because he knows what's about to happen. Judas is about to show up with the soldiers. He's going to be arrested. He's going to be taken. He's going to be falsely tried. He's going to be crucified. He knows what's coming. And they are not ready for it. They are not ready for him to be arrested. Please realize that if they had prayed, they would have been ready for the temptation but because they didn't, they were not ready for the temptation. And the Gospel of Mark says they fell asleep three times. They were sorrowful. They weren't prayerful. Be a person of prayer. If you've got to go without sleep, go without sleep. Don't go without prayer. They were not ready for what was coming. You know, God through prayer answers our prayers. God through prayer addresses challenges in our lives and he shows us the way. He tells us and gives us direction about what to say, what to do, what not to do. We have to spend time in prayer to know that. He directs our paths. There was an airplane pilot uh, flying a small plane and he was you know, say four or 500 feet above ground, and there was a two-lane curvy road below him. And there was this 18-wheeler truck, all right, 18-wheel truck. Uh, and a car behind was always trying to pass, but every time the car tried to pass, it would be a curve or another vehicle was coming. And this went on for a little bit of time. I mean, the pilot picked up on it way ahead of him and because the plane was going faster than the automobiles, but still he was able to watch this happen multiple times. And he thought to himself, I wish I could go down there to the driver and tell him when it's clear to pass. Even on a curve, I could tell him it's clear to pass, no vehicle's coming. Do you realize that's exactly how God is to us in prayer? He's ready to tell us when it's okay to pass. But we're not listening. Because we've got to run errands. We've got to do this, we've got to do that. Though we don't give him time to tell us in prayer. Let God be the pilot. 
Let him direct your path. Let him reveal to you what you don't know. You say, well, pastor, I don't pray very much, but I don't know what I missed out on. I know you don't because you didn't pray very much. You see, we don't know all that we're missing. But if you want the favor of God upon your life, be close with him. Know his voice and listen and obey. Allow him to speak into your life. Proverbs 3 says, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Let him be the guide in your life. That night, and we'll get to it in the next text, God willing, next Sunday, Judah shows up to betray Jesus with a kiss with the Jewish soldiers. Peter takes out a sword and cuts off the ear of Malchus, one of the soldiers. And Jesus has to say, stop, no more of this. And he goes over to Malchus, puts his hand over his ear and heals him. Why did Peter respond that way? Because he didn't pray. Peter thought, hey, I'm going to go to prison or even to death with you. I'll show you. And he took out the sword to prove to Jesus. But it was exactly what Jesus didn't want him to do. He thought he was doing right. He thought he was honoring Jesus. You think you can be doing right. You think you may be honoring Jesus, but you haven't prayed to know. Are y'all with me? Saying, but I thought it would please you isn't good enough. Not when Jesus wants to tell you the answer to the questions. Jesus can see down the road what you can't see. He knew they would fall into temptation, so he told them to pray, and they still didn't do so. Let me tell you, Jesus is telling me, and he's telling you, pray that you do not enter into temptation. Because if you don't pray, you will. Stephen Alford said this, pray when you feel like it. Pray when you don't feel like it. And pray until you do feel like it. I think that means pray all the time. You know, get alone. Oh, I'm tired. I'm I'm achy. I, I, I got so much to do. Get alone when you don't feel like it with the Lord. And pray until you're glad you're there. Listening to the Lord speak into your life. Jesus was encouraged by the angel. Jesus was given direction from this. Because we know he goes on to the cross, does he not? He goes on to endure the suffering so that we would not be left in eternity of hell, but we could be saved and rescued from our sin and forgiven of our sin and made new. And so I ask you today, have you received the grace of God? He went on to the cross. He took your sin to the cross. He bore it in his body upon the cross. He paid your debt. He paid for your guilt so that you don't have to bear it today, but you can be forgiven. You can be made new. You can be set free. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? If you'll bow your heads and close your eyes, please. Right where you're sitting right now, you can call on the name of the Lord Jesus and be saved. Saved from your sin that's leading you to hell. The Bible says in Romans 10, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Lord is owner, master. So you confess, Jesus, you are my boss. You are my master. You are the owner of my life. I die to self. I give my life to you. And if you'll confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and believe in your heart that God did raise him from the dead on the third day, then you shall be saved from your sin that's leading you to hell. Right where you're sitting right now, you can say, Jesus, I'm a sinner, and I I now turn from my sin, and I confess you as my Lord, and I believe, Jesus, you rose on the third day. Save me. And on the authority of God's word, he will save your soul. You will never be the same. You're his. In a moment, we're going to stand and sing. I encourage you to to step out and come share with a pastor that you just called on the name of the Lord, that you just placed your trust in him, and you are now a child of God. For some of you, you may be saying, I want to do that, but I still have questions. I don't understand. I don't, 
I don't fully get it. Can God really save me? Would you step out and come when we stand and sing in just a moment? Share that with a pastor. We want to counsel you. We want to encourage you. We want to pray with you. We want to help you. Maybe the Lord is speaking to you about baptism. You know the Lord, but you've never been faithful in believer's baptism. May you step out and share that with us, and we'll talk to you about baptism and schedule that baptism in the days ahead. Maybe the Lord's leading you to become officially part of the Millington First Baptist family. Oh, we would delight in that. We would love to speak with you and allow you to begin the membership process today. We thank you for being here, and we thank you for listening to the Spirit of God guide you here. Maybe you've come under conviction today that you don't have a customary place, a customary time, that you've allowed the business of, the, of life to get in the way of solitary prayer with the Father. Today, you want to confess that and start afresh with the Lord, making prayer a priority where you submit to him and listen to him. Holy Spirit, would you just guide? Would you work? Would you move people to respond publicly as many also respond privately? I pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.